Good evening. Welcome to the final event for the 2013 Boris Symposium. My name is Lisa Salisbury, and I'm the coordinator for programs at the university's Women's Center. I'm also one of the co-chairs of this year's Bora Committee, together with my colleague, Dr. Ellen Kittel. This year marks 75 years since the first Bora Foundation-sponsored program, which featured an address by then First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt. It also marks the 65th consecutive annual Bora Symposium, dating from the first event in 1948, entitled The Causes of War and the Conditions for Peace. The 2013 symposium, Sports, War, and Peace Beyond the Battlefield, has explored the connections between sports, war, and peace, examining the cultural accessibility of sports and their ability to radically transform the lives and futures of young people across the United States and in other parts of the world. We have been privileged over the past three days to host a number of activists and leaders for change who've encouraged us to delve deeper into the effective use of sports in peacemaking and community development in both a national and an international context. President Nellis will shortly introduce our keynote speaker, a true ambassador to the peacemaking role of sports in contemporary society, an individual whose organization's work has been both groundbreaking and life-changing. First, the Bora Foundation Committee wishes to sincerely thank the College of Letters, Arts, and Social Sciences, the Merton Institute, Campus Recreation, the Department of Political Science, the School of Journalism and Mass Media, and the Program in International Studies for their support of this year's symposium. In addition, the Office of the President generously sponsored a reception this evening for symposium participants. For more information about the Bora Foundation or to make a donation to support our work, please visit our website at www.idaho.edu forward slash Bora. Now it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Dwayne Nellis, President of the University of Idaho. As the Chief Executive Officer of Idaho's nationally recognized research and land-grant university, Dr. Nellis is responsible for nearly 14,000 employees and students, as well as a budget in excess of $453 million. That responsibility extends to more than 70 education, research, and extension facilities. Dr. Nellis serves as a commissioner for the Northwest Commission of Colleges and Universities and the Western Interstate Commission for Higher Education. He has also held other leadership positions and continues to be active in other national and international bodies, including the Association of Public and Land Grant Universities, the National Council of Colleges of Arts and Sciences Research Universities Committee, the Association of American Geographers, the National Council for Geographic Education, Gamma Theta Upsilon, the International Geographic Honor Society, and the Kansas Academy of Sciences. Prior to his appointment at the University of Idaho, Dr. Nellis served as Provost and Senior Vice President at Kansas State University. He also served as Dean of the Eberly College of Arts and Sciences, Western Virginia University's largest academic college. Dr. Nellis has been recognized for his research and teaching by the Association of American Geographers and the Institute of British Geographers. He is also a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. Please help me welcome our own University of Idaho president, Dr. Dwayne Nellis. Thank you, Lisa. It truly is a pleasure to be here tonight and to welcome all of our honored guests and friends uh, to the Bora Symposium. In 1929, Chicago attorney Salmon Levinson established the William Edgar Bora Outlawry of War Foundation at the University of Idaho to honor and continue the work of Idaho Senator William Bora on behalf of peace. 
We use the shortened name of the Bora Foundation now, but the cause of peace is more relevant than ever. Supported by the University's Martin Institute, the Bora Foundation advances the research and teaching about the causes of conflict and peaceful resolution. For more than 50 years, the Bora Foundation has sponsored an annual program examining the causes of war and the conditions necessary for lasting peace. A committee of the University of Idaho faculty and students chooses the topics each year, and this year's topic focuses on sports. Sports provide a common language for many here in the United States. In fact, we're inundated by sporting opportunities, both as participants and as fans, and I certainly feel that as a university president. Access to sports may be less abundant in some other parts of the world, but they still provide an international language and an opportunity for building community. That's the thought behind this year's Bora Symposium, Beyond the Battlefield, Sports, War, and Peace. With gold medal performances by former Vandal student athletes like Kristen Armstrong, and athletes aided by our researchers at a recent Summer Olympic game in uh, London, our symposium organizers felt that this theme would resonate with our local community, thereby providing a deeper, more global perspective to the role of sports in contemporary society. Many speakers and participants have come to engage us in a discussion of the common language and the restorative nature that might be drawn from sport they are ambassadors to the effective use of sports in peacemaking and in community development in the international context. Their work can, can provide life-changing differences in war-torn parts of the world. Working together to use the vehicle of sports, we can use sports as a successful alternative to war as well as a healing force in the aftermath of war. That's where tonight's keynote speaker recognizes an international opportunity, and he is truly making a difference. Johan Koss is one of the greatest Winter Olympic athletes of all time, with four Olympic gold medals and 10 world records for speed skating to his name. He made world headlines in the 1994 Lillehammer Olympic Games with his gold medals. He had three gold medals in the 1500, 5000, and 10,000 meter events. However, he joined us because of his work, he's joined us because of his work to translate his academic, a athletic prowess into humanitarian pursuits. As the founder and CEO of Right to Play, an athlete driven international humanitarian organization, it uses sport and play as a tool for the development of children and youth in the most disadvantaged areas of the world. Since Lillehammer, Johan has dedicated himself to growing right to play into internationally recognized, uh, into an internationally recognized non-government organization and a leader in sport for development. Sport for development uses sport and play to enhance the healthy physical and psychosocial development of children and build stronger communities. Today, Right to Play develops and implements child and community development programs in more than 20 developing countries, working with the UN and other agencies such as UNICEF, the UN Refugee Agency, and the World Health Organization, and many others. Johan, Johan was given the Child Survival Award in 1996 by the Carter Center in Atlanta and later that year, during the celebration of UNICEF's 50th anniversary, he was given the UNICEF Honorary Award. His efforts have led to his recognition of one of the 100 future leaders of tomorrow by Time Magazine, and one of 1,000 global leaders, and a young global leader by the World Economic Forum. Using the language and practice of sports to make a difference is something that has already been seen through the breakthrough medium for change and healing through his efforts. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Johan Kaus to University of Idaho. Wow, 
Wow, thank you so much, uh, President Dr. Nellis. Uh, and thank you for this incredible warm welcome to the university. I also feel that uh, I'm coming in from uh, Toronto in Canada and we still had uh, snow and cold weather, so I really appreciate the nice weather you have. <laughs> thank you. And if you guys put a little light on in the back so I can see everybody, because I don't see anyone, and I find, you know, we're gonna stand up here, and I'm gonna see, and if you put light on, you don't fall asleep, you know, during my <laughs> time here. I'm, I'm, I'm great honored to be here um, at the university and to in invited me to attend the Bora Symposium, you know, the Beyond the Battlefield Sports War and Peace. Thank you. There you go. I, oh, oh, I see you. I know I've been in university before. Uh, and particularly on the back row, that was where I was sitting. Uh, you know, if you find three shares in the back, you can lay it down. I don't know that. <laughs> you know. I have, uh, I have a lot of years behind me at the university, personally. I have uh, 10 years at the medical training, and then two years as a business class. So I, tr I, I know how to sleep during lectures. <laughs> uh, so I love, uh, and I love being back and keeping you awake. So I hope to do that. I also, you know what, there's been great, uh, the Bora Symposium. I want to congratulate uh, the fellow speakers uh, and the, the the, the people who has engaged in the activities, both uh, Sergei D. Bunky, you know, Kevin, Ben, and Laura is, uh, is here. I think uh, you should give them a, a big hand, actually, because they... <clears throat> they've been very active uh, in uh, trying to kind of engage everybody, both practically and through uh, conversations about what sport can do for society, and particularly in areas of conflict. And of course, Standing here tonight, the night after Alex Wolf speaking, that's a big, uh, you know, honor of me because, I mean, you guys all know him from yesterday. It's right, telling histories about what sport has done um, throughout, both good and bad. But, you know, what, amazingly, he's like one of the best uh, writers in Sport Illustrated uh, magazine. I'm very proud of uh, having a one front cover, <laughs> an important one in 94 when I became the Sportsman of the Year. So. Uh, and that's, I mean, the only Norwegian actually making that. So now Maren, she sits here, and the Norwegian student, give her, you all, we have one Norwegian student at the university, okay? And Maren, she plays basketball. Uh, so she has a one goal. Uh, she has one goal, I mean, other than she, of course, they all won, you know, the basketball league now recently, and the, the team won, but she also is going to be the sportman, sportswoman of the year, of course, at Sport Illustrated. So, Alex, stay, watch this Norwegian woman here from Idaho University in basketball, okay? Um, so my name is uh, Johan Koss. I'm, um, uh, I'm here to share, like, a little bit of my personal stories, my experience, how I got to here, and also my passion for power and sport and play and how that can transform society. Uh, I'm also the founder of Right to Play. Right to Play is an international organization. We're based in Canada um, and I live in Toronto. I moved there many years ago. Uh, but we use the power of sport and play to build essential life skills in children. And uh, actually, they by trying to create social change. And we're working in over 20 countries around the world. And we target the most marginalized children in the world. Um, the persons with disabilities as well, or children affected by HIV AIDS, of course, street kids, orphans. But you're also talking about children affected by war, particularly refugees, child combatants, and, and others who has, you know, unimaginably lived in the worst situation we can imagine in the world today. Today, we as an organization are actually reaching one million children in activity every single week in these places. And I'm proud to say that over 50% of them are girls, knowing that girls are a very important group to reach in these societies. So our sport and play program is, is designed to foster behavior change uh, in children and youth by engaging them in preventing and resolve conflict in their lives. It's not only to intervene in conflict and post-conflict settings, but also to address the causes of structured violence by working at the at-risk communities. But before I say a little bit on behavior change and how sport can create behavior change, I think I just wanted to kind of quickly give you my view 
of how we can create behavior change. And it's, have anybody tried to change your behavior? Huh? Okay, so that's impossible, all right? So we try, and not only we, you know, and you, have you tried to change somebody else's behavior? Well, I mean, if you're married, most of us have tried, okay? Um, and the ones who have not been married, good luck. Uh, but, you know, we, uh, uh, I, I found there is one thing, and that's a speed skater. I was a speed skater, as um, the, you know, President uh, uh, mentioned, and I don't know if you know speed skating. Do you guys know speed skating? I mean, it's not normally, that's great. It's a very easy sport, okay? Uh, you go straight for, forward and first left, and just keep doing it, round and round and round the track. You know, so I realized there was a training and I was asked to, uh, you know, we, we go in the turns and you had to lift your, you know, I, I'm gonna, okay, I, she told me I can, I can actually go on the stage with this. <laughs> so you had to go like this and you had to, you know, move your leg over like this and sit it down on the right and then she, you know, push with the left and then push with the right. Have you seen Bonnie Blair and Dan Jansen, Joey Cheek, like all those fabulous Americans? He, he won all these gold medals, they're great. So. My coach told me once, you know, I was going to lift my leg a little higher than I did before. Uh, behavior change. It's, it was really, first of all, it was a kind of a critical comment because I hadn't skated so well, so you hate that when you get criticism, don't we all? Uh, so I said, you know, how are we going to make that? So, you know, immediately I tried, and if you do something new, so I had lifted it barely over. I was like, eh, 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 you know. So I tried, and so okay, now I wanted to sit it down like this, you know, okay? And then immediately I, uh, you know, tried, it felt wrong. And it's just an amazing thing. You know, it wasn't me. I don't do it that way. I do it this way, you know? <laughs> and my coach said, you know what, you know, okay, you can keep doing that, but you will never get good. Uh, so you want to change. So, you know, and the interesting point of this is that I had done the first movement about a thousand, these thousands of times in one way. And to make a change, I had to do it a new way many, many times before I felt it was right. But, you know, if I'm going to do it that way to make it feel right, obviously... I mean, make it feel wrong a lot of times. So think about that when you're trying to make change. If you're actually doing something different, uh, you m it might be right, because obviously it was more effective for me, and I skated much faster when I actually got that movement in there. You know? So it's actually an interesting component, because we, uh, you know, when we're trying to change behavior, and we think about this, we talk about, I can't really change behavior because it's not me. I don't want to do anything different. And you know why? It's because we just one problem. We are creatures of habit. We just do what we have done so many times again and again and again. That doesn't mean that it's right to do it. All right? So that's the one. So element. So principle number one, what you do is who you are. And that's your behavior you will express. I think if there's one thing you're going to remember, remember that. Okay? So that's one thing. And the second thing to create behavior change is, and I'll come back to this in my story, which I'm going to come back to, is important others. And many of you have finally gotten out of this horrible teenage years. And you enter into college, and you are in the blossom of your life. You're encouraging, and you don't really care what others think about you anymore. Isn't that true? No. I mean, <laughs> the bad news is that we are created as individuals because we are dependent on others. And we are, as we got born, as a newborn, and I have a nine-month-old, so I get witnesses every single day when I'm home, which is very rare, uh, because I like traveling a lot to universities and speak. Uh, so then you're looking at these young, young creatures. When they're born, they know one thing. What does a baby know, like the newborn baby know, intuitively, genetically? They can't survive without the support of another. Okay, so the, the ultimate element to survival for us is we are dependent on other people. Okay, and the sad news for us is that this genetic need of others is with us for the rest of our life. 
even though we realize that we can survive, even though when we grow up and we learn how to feed ourselves and we can look after us and we don't need to have somebody change our diapers anymore, then we actually manage to, you know, survive. But we are still have this need of uh, important others. We do need, we have that. So what other people think about us is critical for how we behave. Principle number two. And then the principle number three is very, very simple. It's the constant conversation we have inside ourselves. And it's funny enough, I've, I hear about 300 conversations at the moment. And, and that's, the, that's the truth. Every single person, we talk to each other all the time. And when I'm talking to myself now, I'm saying, my God, I at least get 20% looking at me at the room here. This is great. I see somebody looking at the phone. So can I get, look up here, okay, please. So, you know, you constantly actually have a conversation and you make that decision. So the, what you are saying to yourself in the true sentence, the decision you make inside yourself obviously has an influence on your behavior. You agreeing? All right. So... That's all, I mean, of course, all of this, it's set inside an environment, a structured, we are always in an environment, we are always, we can never, never not be in an environment. Even when we are dead, we are in an environment, Even we can't change behavior when we are dead. But, but, it's, but it's true, we are always in, in a structure, and a setting, and you can, so, so I can, when you create programs for behavior change and you want to change something, you have to kind of influence those four things. You see? So that is the key to creation of behavior change. It's in my opinion. All right? Does that sound reasonable? Anybody is opposing? And there's a lot of professors in the room. I'm scared, actually. <laughs> so I want to go back, uh, just going back in time to my own personal experience and tell you kind of where I come from. Because as I was, uh, you know, I, I was a young man in the in the 20s, I was your age, more than many of yours, I was actually 25 when I was on the podium in Lillehammer, in my home country. Uh, with the, This was the Olympic Games, we hosted it in Norway, we only hosted it twice in our you know, history of the Olympic Games, 52 and in 94, and I want to accept my first gold medal, and it was just totally incredible. I remember just entering in, this was the we were skating in the Viking ship. It's, that makes sense for you guys, you know? Norwegians, Vikings, all that kind of stuff, yeah. And I can't say Vs and Ws, so I mix that up a lot, so don't worry about it. That's a Norwegian thing. Uh, <laughs> but we were inside a Viking ship, and I remember entering my first race, and it was 15,000. And I, we come up in a tunnel, and there was, and I put my head up with a headband of the Norwegian flag, and everybody goes, wow! He got that, I put my head down, and go, totally quiet, you know? So, and I, I went over in the, in the corner, you know, when, when we, and I put my skates on, and I got standing ovation for every knot I made on my skates. <laughs> he got his skates on! This is looking promising. <laughs> you know, there was, uh, it, was just, it was just incredible. I remember, actually, what I did in the first, before my race, I, start, I walked around the stadium just waving to the public and thanking them, as I've already won. I hadn't, and I was extremely nervous. It was my, I've was been, never been so nervous in my entire life for one race. But it was one thing in my, in my stomach. There was a knot. It was like a message. There was something inside me who told me, I am going to do my best. This is my time. I, I skated the Olympics in Albertville. I won the world championship. I had Olympic gold medal. I had everything, but I never had that strength from within. I wanted to do my best. That sentence, it was like, I, I just felt it as I was gliding around just before the starting. And I was just so curious, where did that come from? And long time later, I tried to figure it out. How could I have that moment of strength when I needed it the most? Where did that inner sentence come from, which didn't come from my brain, but it came from my depth of my gut? When I was seven, no, I was 11 years old, I was on the farm to my grandmother. My grandmother, she was that tall, and it's just like the farms up here. She was maybe this tall. She was this big, all right? 
and I loved being with her. And I, 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 I was that summer, and this was the summer of 79, just before the Olympics in 1980, and I, I see someone who's gray here, here, Alex and I remember, of course, the Lake Placid Olympics, but there is, a, there is like this thing, but in 79, there was a world championship speed skating in Oslo, and I was there, there was 30,000 people, and there was an American who won. He, his name is Eric Haydn. Now he gets a little bit of history here. Oh my God, he was my hero. Oh, Eric. You know what, we gave him, we gave him a Norwegian girlfriend because we wanted him to be Norwegian. <laughs> he didn't take her. I was, you know, he was my hero and I, w I just wanted to be like him. I wanted to be a world champion. I wanted to be an Olympic champion. I was like, I had a dream. And so when I was that summer with my grandmother, she was telling me, Johan, you know what? What are you thinking about? You're so quiet. So I was very quiet that day which was kind of unusual, <laughs> and surprise to everybody here, I'm sure. But, and I said, you know, I really have a dream. I just want to be like Eric Hayden, but I want to be like a doctor like my parents, because I have, both my parents are medical doctors. And then I said I wanted to help children in Africa. And my, and my grandmother looked at me, and she said, Johan, I think you can do all that. You are absolutely a builder. This is so fine. You can do whatever you want. And I was like, huh? <laughs> okay. Uh, she did not remember that I wasn't a very good speed skater. <laughs> I was horrible at school, and in Africa was really far away from Norway. <laughs> uh, she didn't mention any of those things to me as I was standing there dreaming my dream. She said one thing, though. Um, you better eat well if you're going to do that. <laughs> so, but you know what? Because she believed in me, I started believing in myself. And on that day, on the 5,000 meter first race in the Olympics, there was one person on the first row. She was standing there, the only race she ever watched me race was that, that first 5,000 meter in the Olympics. And I guarantee you, I wouldn't be standing here today telling you this story, it hadn't been for her. That voice I got from the inside was created by the support she's given to me throughout all those years. That my, given my opportunity from the team members, the coaches, the leaders, the, my fellow competitors, my team members, like everybody, but that that there was really the abilities that I was allowed to dream was gave me the opportunity to set those goals. Which gave me that chance to prove in front of my country fellow men what I can do my best is to skate those 5,000 meter. I always think about that because I meet children in the world today in settings where they're not allowed to dream. Where even having a dream seems totally unrealistic. And I'm thinking how fortunate, privileged, lucky I was and have been to grow up in a safe, wonderful environment as it was in Norway. And how incredible what the ticket what a lottery ticket it was that I was picked to grow up there. When I see these hundreds of thousands, actually millions, today 11 million living in refugee camps alone, affected by war. And I'm thinking about like, what should they be dreaming about? Who are their supporters? Who are the one who's looking at them and saying, you can do it, you just have to eat well. <laughs> Where are they going to get the self-confidence and the belief from? I will say that, you know, I grew up in Norway with physical education as part of the school curriculum at a club, at a safe and structured setting. There was all infrastructure in place that allowed me to learn how to skate, uh, random enough. I had access to the skating rink where 
It was the most natural thing. My parents left me go at I was seven by myself, the two kilometers to the rink, walking so I can get to the training. They didn't worry about anything. Later, I qualified for incredible coaches, and as I mentioned, all of these privileges, what I've gained and got to achieve my goals. I also think, you know, sometimes, you know, what, how often do we reflect over the privileges we have? How often do we sit and think, think about, you know, have I actually been that lucky? Obviously, I was incredible, and I had an incredible career, and being at the Olymp top of the Olympics, but you know, even saying, looking away from that and looking at our lives, here we live in Idaho or if we live in Toronto or in Oslo or wherever we are, I did not know my privilege before six months prior to the Olympics in Norway. I had an opportunity to be an ambassador for a program called Olympic Aid, which was initiated by the Lillehammer Olympic Organizing Committee by a woman who watched a television of a child suffering the war in Sarajevo, who had a child the same age and said, this is not fair, Sarajevo was an Olympic city in 1984, only 10 years prior to Lillehammer. And she's looked at this child who had no chance to grow up safely, even was shot at, and said, you know, how is that fair that my child can live here in this safety? We have to do something. And she motivated and challenged me to support. And I had the chance to be an ambassador, which I was proud of, not knowing what I was signing up to, to go to Eritrea, another country of war. 30 years of civil war with the Ethiopians. Uh, finally, resolutions was in kind of 1991, the 93 independence, and I was there only a couple of months later, traveling. Uh, into the city of Asmara. And I, I was there, you know, I was meeting a lot of children and one group of boys, and I, it's just so interesting because they were about 10 to 12 years old, just the same age I was when I was starting dreaming about skating. And I, I looked at these boys and they were, one of them were very popular, and I said, why are you so popular? I can't, you know, they were all laughing at me, this group. And, uh, and, I, and, it's, and they say, can't you see that? No, I have no, I have no, so, so, look, he has long sleeves. All right. Uh, okay, well, none of the other kids had that. They had short sleeves or they, none of them had shirts at all. And then and I said, what do you mean? And I said, okay, well, watch us. And he took off his shirt, rolled it together, and the sleeves became a knot around the rest of the church, shirt. So that became a ball. And that's how they could play uh, what we call football in Europe, what you call soccer here. That's how they could play soccer in the street. And they said, we dream about playing soccer. We want to play, and he had to be there. That's why he was, he was so popular. <laughs> so they could play. And I said, have you ever seen, have you ever played with a proper ball? And I said, never. They looked at me like I was coming from a different planet. And I said, that when I'm coming back after the Olympics, I'm going to bring you sport equipment. I'll promise. I'm going to bring you some balls. Well... I was reminded about that promise um, after my winnings. And uh, after my three races, and I, you know when you have uh, three races in a week and you get three gold, gold medals and three world records, you have a pretty good week. <laughs> Recommended to all athletes out there, okay? <laughs> um, so after the excitement surrounded with my gold medals, I decided a time to follow up on my promise to the children. So when I did, I went and I challenged the Norwegian children. You know, you know, we have a lot of usable sport equipment lying around. Like, you must have something. I, I'm sure you also have it. I had a lot of things. And I was thinking, they must have something they can give, which I can collect, which they don't use, and I can bring down to Eritrea. You know, it, it took a couple of weeks, and across Norway I had 13 tons of sport equipment. Uh, that was absolutely incredible. Uh, it was a drive from children all around Norway, which I'd never seen before, and I had the opportunity to travel and visit all of them. So as I was about to leave uh, Oslo, we rented the plane, we filled it up, had all of this equipment. Uh, a journalist in Norway wrote on the headline on the biggest newspaper in Oslo, 
I was going to say it in Norwegian, or should I say no, it's, You know, Koss is bringing soccer balls to starving kids. What an idiot. Yes. I, this was only two, year, two months after the Olympics, guys. It's a big downfall from that. <laughs> I've never been called an idiot on the front page before. Um, the reason he did write that, because the president of Eritrea had called for food, and I was bringing sport equipment. That's, so I felt defeated. I was kind of embarrassed, but I couldn't turn around. I was responsible for this program, for the equipment, and for all the children in Norway donated it. And I didn't know what I was going to do, so uh, there was no turning back. I, I did then call the journalist and said, you better join me, <laughs> because I want to see how this goes. Uh, and to much of my surprise, he accepted. We loaded ourselves. We flew down. I had brought some kids. And as I'm arriving in Asmara for my second time in my life, the news had gotten out that I was arriving in this equipment. And I'm, com we, I'm landing, and I'm... I'm feeling as nervous as I was before my 5,000 meter race, but certainly not as sure. And I was looking out the window and I saw thousands of people. There was over 100,000 people in the streets of Asmara that day, welcoming us as a gift from Norway for sport equipment. I don't think I've seen so many people in the stadium ever because I've never been to the United States yet. Um, and I had the chance, they put me on a bike and we rode through the streets and we celebrated and we had Norwegian and Eritrean flags and it was all kind of excitement. And we rode up to the president's palace and I met with the president. And you know, I said to him, I collected some sport equipment um, and I know you asked for food, I must have made a big mistake. I had to admit I was a bit nervous because the journalist was sitting there with his pen in hand, you know that Alex, you know that situation, we're right there. He was ready for the response, he's gonna confirm his, uh, you know, Objection here. And then the president looks at me and says, Johan, the gift you brought to our country has more meaning than any gift we ever received. Because it means that we are more than something to just be kept alive. That our children are human beings, as whole human beings, that they also should have the opportunity to dream and to play sport and to participate. He told me then that, you know, the gift might could be bring us a better hope and a better future for this war-ravaged country. He then told me that the school attendance has been dropping around the schools. The kids hadn't attended. They had no equipment. And he said the first time this equipment might get into the schools and can help children be attracted to schools again. What a clever idea. I remember looking at him and, and thinking, this is what I've taken for granted. This is what I always believed was given to everybody. And he's saying this is the greatest gift they ever received. Just to have the chance to play. But it's also, of course, much more than just playing. It's about the opportunity to bring the society together, to set new goals and targets, to get out of the hatred, to get out of the violence, and start respecting one another. I had to say that when I returned to Norway, the journalist did write a separate new article, and we both had learned a lot from that trip, and that was incredible. I had to admit today, almost 20 years later, that I was naive. <laughs> I was a very early international development practitioner. I made so many mistakes. I visited the countries, more children. I spoke with more leaders. And you know, programs is much more than just simply delivering equipment. It's more about building the infrastructure in the society around the people, making the people the heroes in the communities making them the leaders who can lead the change of the activities. 
and trust me, the equipment will arrive. I tell you the story because actually just prior to my, on my first trip, I had another experience. I was walking alone in Asmara, and there was, this was you know, so similar because I, I looked at these younger kids. They were six, seven years old, and they were looking up on the uh, pictures, and there was a big posters, and you can imagine the big heroes um, or posters of the heroes of the country. And I was turning around, what are they? And they were admiring these, these heroes. And I was looking around, what are they? And of course, they were the martyrs. They were the soldiers with the guns standing in front of them who has liberated the country. I am not against celebrating veterans and the support of democracy and all sorts of things. But when I looked at those children and seeing that that was the only hero they had, what will they turn into? And as I was thinking that, at the same time, the group of bike riders came through. And imagine this, Eritrea was an Italian colony before the Second World War. And they brought in bikes, because Italy, they only ride bikes, you know, they don't know how to drive cars, if you've ever been there. So, but they're very good on the bike. And they brought bikes there. And these old bikes, they were still there, and they were riding them. And these kids, these six and seven-year-olds, they were running around, sharing at these bike routers. Couldn't be more in the end of teenage years. And they were like, wow. And I was thinking, like, what, what type of heroes do we want? Who do we want them to look up to? Could it be athletes and coaches and not soldiers to become their heroes? What if they use sport to teach the pers uh, perseverance and dedication will make them strong and not guns? That fairness, respect for one opponent, and negotiation skills that will help them solve conflict, not violence. What if we give them opportunity to play, have fun, and simply be children, while at the same time helping them believing in themselves? So all these questions led me to create Right to Play. And through our work, we are providing children with the opportunities to develop skills and characteristics they need to lead informed, healthy, and joyful lives. And we do this through the power of sport and play. I mean, so why sport? I mean, obviously for me, my background is sport. But sport is arguably the most popular activity. You can see it from the hype around events like the Olympics and the World Cup, but I'm sure the president enjoyed the victories of the university. Anytime the team will come to his office and get celebrated, I hope, and the pictures comes up on the wall. Uh, you keep doing that wherever you go. And, you know, we always have this. The sport is a universal popularity that transcends national, cultural, and political boundaries. There's an ability to connect individuals and communities like nothing else I've ever seen. It's inherited social. Uh, it can unify people from diverse backgrounds and create bonds between people that wouldn't other exist. The characteristics incredible, powerful, particularly in the post-conflict settings and where ethnic tension exists. I visited a family in Palestine many years ago after we started a project within the West Bank. And I talked to the parents of another 12-year-old boy, and they were telling me, you know, this was in the height of jihad and the problem and the conflict between Israel and Palestine. It's fortunate at the moment it's calmed down a bit. But it was fascinating to talk to the parents who had the same, you know, wish for their own son that I have for my own son today. And they were looking at them and saying, Thank you for creating that program. We never had a sport program in our community before, but now he's playing soccer. And you know, he was on the way to be recruited as a suicide bomber against Israelis. And we managed to take him out of that program. We managed to bring him into a program because he has peers he likes to hang out with. He likes to play because he's scoring a goal and he's making mistakes because he's learning from them and he's setting himself goals, they say. And you know, he had decided he wanted to be a contributing con individual. He's a 12-year-old boy. There are many groups out there today in the extreme societies that are recruiting these 12-year-olds to do evil manners, to bring them in. 
and to tell them that the only way to solve conflict is through violence and war, and even in the worst case, taking their own lives as a suicide bomber. Remember, we need to build a, a society. We need to build the structure in those communities which reflect positive values for the people who are there so they have a chance to express their own interest and their own participation. Because if that not exists for a child, if that opportunity doesn't exist, they only have one place to go. The participation obviously makes kids strong and healthy, but that's not the only sport can do. In our program, we have found, in addition to these incredible elements and violence prevention, increased respect, self-confidence, and all these things we, we take for granted, but to enhance education and create an environment conductive to learning. By providing these programs, for instance, our evaluation of programs shows that kids are obviously attending school more. They stay in school and improve concentration level and readiness to learn. And the result in participation promotes stronger academic performance. In Pakistan alone, currently we have 165,000 children in program, over half of them girls, who previously weren't allowed to go to school, if you can imagine. How you can make a difference how we can create the contribution to gender equity. For girls, sport can to build the skills and confidence so they feel empowered. In many communities where we work, the gender segregation is practiced. Girls tell us that our program is so important because the only time they get to participate in organized activity outside of their home, when they can learn new skills and develop social networks. So as I mentioned, I'm proud because over 50% of our participants are girls. The, the role of sport is extremely important in post-conflict settings and in communities affected by war. For communities that are rebuilding after war, sport can help restore life back to normal. It can provide people's relief from difficult circumstances for children in particular. It can be in an excellent way to acknowledge and work through traumatic experiences. Knowing how post-traumatic stress syndrome can take a child's life, not for one week, two weeks, a month, or a year, but for the entire life, if you can reduce that traumatic experience after it's happened, can put them on a path of success. It doesn't need to be in success of sport. Although sport alone cannot prevent conflict or build peace, sport programs that emphasize the best values of sport, fair play, teamwork, respect for one opponent, and adherence to mutually agreed upon rules can contribute to broader peace building efforts. And I've used this example of showing work with child soldiers in south of Sudan who was just been taken out of the rebel group and came to our programs in partnership with UNICEF. And these children, these boys, has been in the, in the, as a child soldier from the age of 8, 9, or 10, and now they were 14 and 15 years old, and they haven't experienced a rule in their life to be followed. Many of them had to become survivors, had to kill their best friend. The only permanent was change, change in their ability to survive. And here they're coming, trying to get back into normal society. Trust me, they wouldn't be sitting still as you have wonderfully done today for a single second. So what we did was we gave a ball and we said there are no rules. Take the ball and do what you want. You guess what happened? They fight for it. Or for good English word, actually. One of the strongest took the ball. He wrapped it under his arm and ran away from the field, and we never saw him again. <laughs> we had 19 boys left. And we looked at each other and said, well, that wasn't much fun, was it? And so we only have one more ball here. That's what we, what we do about that. And these children created their own rules. They sat down and described the rules they wanted to follow. They set up the teams. They gave them themselves to be the referee. They described the glue of our society. They described why we have rules around us, why it's so important for us to follow a certain structure. 
just with a simple ball. I have to say that I'm, I'm sorry to hear that international development, and many of you here studies international studies, and some of you have focused on development. If you look through the years of international development, there has been no funds committed to support building civil society through sport. They haven't thought about what build our own society. If I go back to Norway, looked after the Second World War, and what actually graded our value-based system was our volunteer sports structure, where everybody came together after the Second World War, even you know, the one on both sides and come, came together and said, okay, we want to create a better society. We want to rebuild our country, and we do it to participation to do it something together. And they did it and they created it. And in international development, that has been forgotten. For us, that is a key element of restructure of the societies we're trying to build. Never forget what's the glue in the society. We have numerous of resources created in specific settings of the war. Uh, war. And it's called Team Up and Youth as a Leader. And they develop with input from peace education and child development experts. The activities these resources contain promote social integration, cohesion amongst community service, facilitation of non-violent methods for conflict resolution, and addressing the unique vulnerability of children who risk being in conflict. Can you imagine that you can actually create a sport program and do all this? Using the specific examples of refugee settings, our activities help to reduce stress, anxiety, and depression, and provide children with a recipe from a different, from, uh, recipe, uh, from their difficult surroundings. Children gain access to positive stimulation, which contributes to resiliency and help them to regain sense of normality in their lives. Because of the roots of conflict, are deeply entrenched. Our program work to mobilize the interests and support of entire communities, the settings around the children. We use the convening power of sport to rally communities' interests. Events such as the Global Peace Games, special tournaments, and friendly competition bring opposing groups together on the same team many times in the spirit of nonviolence, mutual respect, and collaboration. And decreasing conflict has not only been reported about our participants in schools, but similar transformation have been identified at home, in surrounding communities, in countries such as Benin, Mali, and Liberia. Today, obviously, with the situation in Mali, we are working on a traumatic setting with children suffering by in being internal refugees. While playing games, the focus is joyful participation and competition to ensure that all children, no matter what the level of skill ability, can participate and have fun. I believe that the value of sport and play has not been discovered yet. Even though we reach a million children around the world every single day or every single week, it's not enough. There are hundreds of thousands and, other, and millions of other children who need these type of programs. They need societies who need your support to do more. We cannot let one single child go out there with us, without the support of a coach, a leader, a grandmother, who can tell them, you can do it. Just keep trying and try hard and eat well. This is all about facilitation of opportunities. This is all about making the right choices and the priorities. And if we don't do it for them, Let's do it for ourselves. The world is getting so small that if we want to be safe, if we want our next generation to live in a peaceful society, we need to build these opportunities. We need to have a global effort to doing this. During my time in Eritrea and meeting with the children all around the world ever since, I've learned that children need access to role models, positive people that they can look up to and aspire to be like, whether it's an athlete, a coach, 
or a family member. I believe that every child deserves someone who is rooting for them and giving them the chance to accomplish their dreams. So what about us in this room here today? What can we do all mark, make our mark? Can we reflect on our own personal privilege? When I re returned from Eritrea on my first trip and I felt the understanding of my privilege, I said one thing. Don't waste my own talent. Prior to my trip, I thought I wasn't going to skate the Olympics. I had difficulty with motivation to do all the training. I had yelled at my coach and my team members and unsatisfactory of things which was nuances and stupid issues. When I came back, I reflected that I've been given a talent and I shouldn't waste it. All of you in this room has been given a talent. All of you who are sitting here today, I can guarantee from a perspective of a Somali refugee in Kenya, you are privileged. Don't waste your talent. Set your own mark, follow your dream, and eat well. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Johan, for that passionate and moving talk. Um, I'd like to invite the audience to direct any questions that they have for Johan Koss. There are microphones placed at several spots um, in the middle and then also on, looks like we just have one on the side aisle over here. So if you'd like to form a line behind either of the microphones, um, Johan will hopefully be available to answer questions just as long as there are some. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, first, thank you so much for speaking with us. Um, knowing how effective your organization is, have you ever received opposition to expanding it into new areas? Yes. Um, this is interesting for an organization like us. We get a lot of requests for new programs and new areas to expand into. Uh, the problem is that it never fund, follows funding to it. Uh, you know, it's like the opposite in a for-profit world where demand gives you uh, money. Here, demand requires money. So it's, we have to best be better at raising money to be able to fulfill all the demands we have on the programs. Uh, I wish... Um, I could have been much better at raising money <laughs> because then I could have fulfilled many more of the demands we have. So that is the reason. But we do have a new strategic plan coming out this summer for the next five years. And our goal is to double the number of children in the countries we are operating in. So we'll have two million children in regular activity uh, in the next five years. And we will also look at possibly three or four new countries we're going to expand into, and some of them being in Latin America. I know a lot of your students are studying Latin America here, so that's exciting. And of course, we have Brazil with both the Olympics and the World Cup coming up, so that's an exciting area. If, next, yeah, so do please say your name as well. Uh, sorry. Hello, my name is Angela White. Um, I can't take credit for this question. My friend uh, came up with this, but I'm a little bit more bold, I suppose. Um, <laughs> The question was, uh, what is the process or how, how is it that you're allowed to implement programs for women in countries where culturally it seems almost impossible because that's not a part of their, their customs? Exactly, yeah. Very good question. I appreciate that. In, uh, good, uh, I'll give you an example of Pakistan because I think that's where the f most difficult in the beginning and this was back in 2003 and 2004. We initiated by training Pakistani women in our resources and knowledge about how we're running our program. 
And then they, uh, they truly be started believing in what we we're going to do. And through that process, they actually went into the communities we we're going to work, and they knocked on doors to, to, to where girls were, they knew girls were living with their mothers. And they said, we actually brought 50 girls and 50 mothers out to a, to a program where we had to have walls up so that nobody could see them from the outside. It's very segregated. And then the girls were playing in there. At the same time, we did a program for boys, and it was much easier. So we had thousands of boys in our activity, but we had very few girls. And then, but what happened was that these, uh, the res response becomes stronger and stronger, and the boys get be behave better. And we asked the elderly, like, why they like about our program, and they said, well, you know, they respect us more now. So that was a big incentive. And then, so, and the women started arguing for these type of programs for themselves, for their own daughters. And the, so it was actually driven by women uh, through their own daughters and giving them opportunities. So now we are trained, you know, um, you know, we have, I think, 85 or 90,000 girls in Pakistan in our program. And so it's now it's 50-50, and it's managed to grow to that stage. And it's interesting because it goes under the radar in some ways. It's just like there's, there's a huge enthusiasm of it. And they put right to play branding in the schools and in the community centers. And everybody knows the vision and the values of the organization and, and all that kind of stuff. So I'm actually surprised and shocked how, how amazing that's been to bring that in. And I think the argument was a couple was they would improve on education and they get access to get to self-confidence. And it wasn't necessarily about sport, even though we used the sport. So that was the other argument for it. Hmm. My name is Taylor and I'm a student of the Martin Institute and I've actually studied right to play quite a bit. So it's such an honor hearing you say all these words in person after I've read them on a computer screen so much. <laughs> so thank you for coming. Um, my question is, where does the majority of the funding for right to play come from, and then after you receive it, where does where is most of the money spent? So we have um, uh, thirty-eight percent comes from government, ten percent in addition is from institutional funders, and the other fifty percent is private funding, and that could be from corporations or individuals. So that's kind of the mix of donors who gives us the funds. On the spending side, we have a we have an eighty-five fifteen component. Eighty-five percent goes to programming and 15% goes to reinvestment of fundraising and administration expenses. In the 85%, what we're spending money on this in the field, it's, um, it's obviously you know, training of the trainers and the part local partner organizations, which we're working in partnership. We are doing uh, uh, evaluation and monitoring, we're organizing events, and we're setting up all of that type of structure within that so they can participate in regular activities. So that's like, most of the money goes. Then there is a little portion that goes to advocacy and policy because we have to change the policies within these countries so they actually take it, make it part of the regular work of the government in that country so it becomes more accessible. I and mean, we can only do so much and we need the governments to change this. So we actually spend money on influencing the governments where we are working in those countries. Thank you. My name is Brian, and your program sounds analogous to a lot of programs that be available in, let's say, inner cities that yeah. might target reading or some specific academic skill, where the ultimate goal of the program is to positively impact individual people's lives, knowing that the program itself isn't changing some of the fundamental problems because the program cannot change the fundamental problems of, let's say, Eritrea, you know, countries in civil war. Do you have some sort of vision for your program to help to try to, 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 uh, to, try to uh, impact some of the bigger underlying issues that cause the problems you're trying to help in the first place? Yes, uh, so if you know the Bronnefeimer circle of influences, it's kind of have on the individual in the society. We're trying to influence all sectors of society made change. I just want to give you an example for this. Um, 
and this is, I can give the example because I was just there in Rwanda in the last fall, actually, like four months ago. And I visited a very small community in the south. And one element there is domestic violence. It's a massive problem. Domestic violence against children and against women. So what we have created is, so how, I mean, how can you change? Because, you know, we have to kind of look at this in, in, a, in, a, in a societal context. And you have to change it. But if you can change the whole society, you're actually making a change in that. And if you can keep changing all the societies, you can make that. So what I saw was all of a sudden the, the head of strategy in the municipal government was explaining what we call child protection policies activities which we had created for them and he said this has now become the central platform for their policy of protecting children in society. Then we had a child group which was formed and it was 12, 13 year old boys and girls who formed theater and acted out how child and, and domestic violence was happening and I was sitting there, we were 40 white guys and, then, and women and then there was 900 kids and it was 300 parents and they and then and there was a 13 year old boy who started facilitating with the parents a conversation about how they can protect children from domestic violence and all of a sudden you know they, they were not only saying that this is wrong they were asking what is happening and what is the solution how can we sort this out together and etc etc and then they brought up the police and the police was articulating the number of incidents as was seen in the society and how much they had been increased the reporting of it and the incidences had reduced so you know you're looking at this in the in the context of that you can actually change in that way um, and you have to do it you know a local community at a time to be able to change. And then I believe when you reach a tipping point, you will actually have a massive influence on the politicians who would then make it more policy and legislation format. And that's where at the end you can actually create total sustainable change. So it takes a long time. When I started this, I thought it was gonna take three years. All right, now it's 20 years later and I'm still here, okay? And I'm far from finished, <laughs> please. Hi, yeah, yeah, the team Hagen, and uh, I'm just wondering, you said uh, that sport played a really influential role in Norwe Norway reconstructing itself after the World War. Um, could you talk a little bit more about what that looked like? Yeah, actually, Norway has a different sports structure than we are known here in the U.S. We don't have the school-based sports structure than that that we are kind of used to in our society. What there is a volunteer sports structure in the society it means that people have to rally together and volunteer their time as coaches and parents to create the activity, build the infrastructure and doing that. And of course, after the Second World War, there was nothing available. So that's the way they started rallying around in the communities. And if you go in, and today in Norway, we are about five million uh, people only, it's a small country, uh, and over two and a half million are member of the sports society, you know, as a volunteer or a participant. So you can imagine, and there is not the possibly a parent who today it still doesn't let the child go to a club to participate in a sport activity. It wasn't, doesn't matter what type it is, what type of sport it is, all different types of sports. Uh, and because it's all driven by the passion and the interest of people to give opportunities to others. Uh, and I think this, and if you ask anybody, ask you well, how many hours you spend a week uh, to bring your child to the sport programs or how much, much time you're spending as a volunteer in this program, you say, well, they probably spend between five and 10 hours a week, you know, as an individual, as any person in the country. And you can imagine, that's a massive amount of time of things they're doing over and over and over again, which is actually creating that behavior we want. Because that, I mean, and then they, you know, and they watching the rules and creating the positive atmosphere and giving the opportunities and setting the values and creating self-esteem and, you know, making sure that people are behaving properly. Because sport, again, can go in two directions. It's not necessarily all good, as we know that. And you have to also stop the negative aspects of sport. And that's the process within that system have created the checks and balances because of the, actually the nature of the volunteerism in it. Okay. Yeah, one second. Hello, my name is Angel. Um, you've been mentioning all your work in places like Uganda, Eritrea, Pakistan, and that's all great work, but what I've been wondering is, do you have programs set up in so-called fourth world countries like the United States and Canada? Because even in those countries which are so yeah. much well lost than other parts of the world, the inner city can still look like a battlefield for so many people. 
Yeah. I mean, it's interesting you ask that because I, you know, we are, I wanted to go to the most disadvantaged communities in the world and particularly children affected by war. That was my original thought. But I did also say that after 10 years of programs, I'm guaranteed they're going to ask us to come to Canada and to the U.S. and other places. And actually, t nine and a half years into the program, we, start, we got requested to start in Canada, where we are based, in the First Nation communities, uh, in our own, own communities. And I, I say that it's incredible because they, those communities are sometimes worse off than what I've seen in many other, other places around the world. And they have a, as much of uh, a craving for this type of intervention uh, than I ever seen. And we started in two, two small First Nation reserves and, and after a little while it's expanded to four and then it's all of a sudden expanded to 30 and now we're in 45 of those communities in Ontario alone. And you can imagine this is, uh, this is a very big growth area because of the need, uh, particularly this is youth development program which has been tremendously successful. And we have had a pilot of this now for two and a half to almost three years, and the results have now got into becoming a program for us. So now it's a kind of established program we're continuing building and seeing if we can do that across Canada. On this side of the border, we have actually a pilot going on in early childhood education in New York, in the Bronx. And it's some, one of the things we looked at because in the government schools, there are becoming a new core curriculum for, for um, what we call kindergarten teachers or teachers in, in the community-based organization, which requires the readiness for these very young kids, that are two to two, three and four-year-olds. And we have actually created a methodology where we can help the teachers facilitate that learning uh, for the child through play. Um, uh, and we have test, we are just in the early stage. This is a very early pilot. We will get the result in June to see if we have created uh, better readiness, problem-solving uh, problem ability, uh, creative thinking, literacy and numeracy skills in these young children in the Bronx who comes from very poor families where the achievement gaps already are seen before they start school. Um, and it never, never closes, it just grows. So what we're trying to do is to close it before they get into school and see if it can stay longer in that. So that's the pilot we're doing now. So. Hi, my name is Sean, and I have actually a two-part question, and it's more about your career. Um, as a coach and as a hmm. pre-service PE teacher, um, I will be and I do work with lots of athletes. What, is, what are the traits that you saw in your coaches that impacted you the most? And what's the best advice that you ever got from one of your coaches? Wow. <laughs> I can speak another two hours about this. I don't know if you have time. We should maybe go have a drink. Um, I'm down. Yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, you know, I was extremely fortunate because I had a coach from I was seven to I was finished. Okay, I have the same guy following me. He was 19 when he picked me out of the snow and said, you know, you should try to go around the skating track here and, and help me. He stopped himself pursuing his own career and, and became a coach. And he was my coach throughout my entire career. And we developed together. And I think, you know, as a coach and a relationship with an athlete is the key, is the relationship, the ability to change. Um, and the ability to both changing and understanding what the person needs, it's not the coach responsibility, but the coach's best ability is to make the person, the athletes, responsible for their own results and their own development. And the problem sometimes, and I've seen in coaches, is that they feel so responsible for the athlete's performance that they take that responsibility and don't give it away. Um, and, they, and that's the worst coaches. <laughs> because then they don't empower the athletes to become good. And the best athletes in the world today, they are the one who decides the training they want to do. The coach becomes an advisor, more or less, in the form of, and it changes, of course, from early age to, so I was extremely fortunate because I had a physical educator and a coach, it was the same, he was a physical educator and a coach, and he told me everything he knew, so I can understand why I was doing everything we were doing. Uh, and then we built, the, the, after a while, we built the program together. 
And, and because he was so well educated as a coach from his background, academic background, it helped me really to understand all of the f physiology and the physics and the changes to why we were doing the big things we were doing. And that helped me, and I'm, you know, that's, that helped me to process and develop as a person and be responsible for my own, own achievement. And then I could ask him for what I needed from him. And that's the best relationship because I, I knew exactly what I needed for him to give me instead of he guessing what he should give me, if you say that. But that a little helpful? Probably not. Yeah. Crazy, wasn't it? Yeah. You probably think, I'm, I, had to, I lift a lot of weights, I can say that too. <laughs> Rode a lot of miles on the bike. Hi, I'm Seth, and um, I was just wondering, so as an NGO and everything, how does Right to Play uh, collaborate with other non-governmental organizations to, I don't know, work for your own goals and as well as like UN-related goals? That's a very good question. So what we do in, it's a different, communities have different level of what we call community-based organizational NGOs, and we always partner with them and trying to build their capacity. And sometimes in Africa, Many of those organizations are very weak structurally. So then you have to not only give them the knowledge about how to run the program to, for the children, like what we're teaching them and training them in, in the, but you also have to help them in organizational setups and financial accountability and all sorts of stuff. So you have to build capacity within the partner organization. We have now about 285 partner organizations around the world we are working with closely. So this has become a very kind of dynamic and finding out you, you will never do anything alone anymore. You just work with a number of partners and every partnership has its challenges and its rewards and we learn from all of them, I will say. So it's a, that's a key part of, a part of the success to be able to work with other organizations. Uh, and as, and in, if you go to Latin America, the civil society organization are extremely strong. So you don't need all of that capacity building, but you need the technical skills. So you do a different type of model, working as a technical ability, understanding how to do behavior change, how play can foster this type of behavior change. So we're working on that specific element. Um, and the same is in, in China, I will say. It's a lot of actually fabulous organizations are structured and we work in partnership with them. So, so there's different levels, so depending on where you are. In refugee camps, there are no organizations. And there you had to kind of start from scratch. You had to help them set it up, organize, and you, you create volunteer circles, or community groups, and et cetera, et cetera. And you kind of started from scratch. Yeah. I think that's the last question. Or did you have one too? No. Johan, um, my name is Aziz Makani. I'm a local resident here. I have a personal lighthearted question. <laughs> um, are there competitions for retired Olympians? Uh, that you compete in now? Are you active physically in, uh, in competitions? I don't look very fit, do I? <laughs> <laughs> I know, I do bowling, <laughs> you know. I actually do not compete at all anymore. And personally, I find that, uh, you know, I did, um, I had a health kick in 2007, which I wanted to run a marathon. So I ran a marathon in New York. Uh, which was a traumatic experience, <laughs> <laughs> but I did finish it. Uh, I currently do it for two good reasons: my wife and I want to look good, you know. And I, I said, um, I said to my wife, I just, you know what? I have a goal of uh, having going from a one pack to a six pack before the summer, and she was laughing at me. So, that's, <laughs> so there you go. I mean, today, you know, this is the other thing about physical activity. And I didn't address this in the speech because I take it for granted and I believe all of you know this, but being active is critical uh, for human beings. I mean, we have to move and it's just, we are made to move. We just, we, what we have now created is all these ways we don't need to move, you know, but we are made to move and there's that's, that's a biological uh, reason for that, based on our, the chemistry inside us. But just the release of endorphins is a key for happiness. So, and, and trust me, physical activity creates these things. And there are multiple other like, serotonin changes in the brain and all of these chemicals that function because of that. I mean, that's a simple reason to be physical active. But then, of course, all the health preventive measures of it, being, being more mobile, gives us just a much better life. And I think that is a, 
uh, and that's in the stimulation. And there's nothing else who does it today. You know, we can all, I mean, we can walk, we can dance, we can do all these things. We have to be physical active. So for me included, and I'm much happier, much better concentrated. Um, I have much more energy when I'm active, and that's why I had a fabulous run in Idaho today, this morning when I woke up, so. Um, I'm wondering, now that Right to Play is um, an established NGO, what is your role in the organization? What are, you, like, what are your responsibilities? What does that look like? Oh, it's fortunate that I am not responsible for anything anymore. <laughs> it's easy. I have Laura, you all met, hopefully many of you. She's kind of very active in the youth programming all across Canada and the universities and, and dealing with this kind of have this kind of, I have a fantastic group of people working, many, many, many. We have, I think we have about 600 staff now um, around the world and 13,800 coaches who implement our program. So I'm almost up to your level of staffing here. But I actually beat you a little bit because I have 6,300 junior leaders, and those are the most incredible people. They're between 12 and 18 years old who leads the activities in the communities. So I don't do anything anymore, you know. I just travel around and speak at universities from time to time. And no, I, I still run the organization, though, uh, and I report to a board, um, and I make sure that um, our plans are followed, mostly, and trying to motivate internally in the staff and uh, doing all of the things between. It's actually, um, I find it this is a busy job. Actually, I spend a lot of time working, but I love it. So it's easy, so it's, and it's a good job. I'm, so I'm basically the CEO, which, which we call a CEO, or, or the, the champion. <laughs> I think we can give up that. That was a great question, so thank you very much, everybody. Thank you for your patience and being here today. And as, as we say, when children play, the world wins, okay? Thank you.